arrested him. With me now, Karen Greenberg, the director of the Center on National Security at Fordham University Law School. Karen Greenberg, nice to have you back. Nice uh, to be back. Beginning with this point, this fixation, this obsession with violence, there are those who are fixated, there are those who take that fixation and it materializes into violence. What is the catalyst that drives some to commit such atrocities? Right, and there's, and there's no one answer to that question, but there are a couple of things to look for. One is it's often something personal that happens in their, in their life that either a frustration or a cause of anger or humiliation and something, uh, alienation from the society, alienation from something they want to belong to, and that that becomes the catalyst. Sometimes it's opportunity. Sometimes they see a target, they see an opportunity to do something, or they get, get, see a way to go to a foreign land to fight. Whatever it is, it, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen and which way it's going to turn. There are those individuals who will commit violence given certain circumstances that otherwise might not be violent. You know, one of the catalysts that fascinates you in particular, just because of all your work on this, the Abu Ghraib, um, the, the photos from Iraq from 2004, and this is something that's sort of out in the ether as far as part of what apparently inspired the Kawachi brothers. I mean, that was 10 years ago. Right. 10 plus years ago. 10 plus. And, and for us, that may seem like a very long time, but from the point of view of people who are in this larger narrative of looking at Islam, looking at uh, creating a caliphate, these photographs have been potent since the very beginning. It's one, and, and this administration knows it. I mean, they've been reluctant to release more of these photographs, even in very recent court challenges. And mm. the reason is, for these individuals, the story isn't over. You know, uh, um, Iraq is still going on. Mm -hmm. uh, Guantanamo is still going on. And this narrative has been um, potent and pervasive, and particularly in Europe, since 2004. Maybe that was part of the anger, whatever word you want to use for these Kawachi brothers, but at the same time, when you read into their backgrounds, especially when you hear from this legal source with, with understanding of what sent the younger Kawachi uh, brother to, to prison in 2005, apparently at that time, before he was hardened, um, meeting some of these people who, who uh, helped in this radicalization process, this source said um, that uh, he was uh, against forgive me, um, that he was uh, not, not drinking and smoking at the time, that he um, didn't want to go to Iraq to die there. And my question then is, if we know that there is this hardening in prison, what's being done to keep these people apart? Well, you know, actually the attention to radicalization in prison has been very strong throughout the West and has a strong tradition in France where they've understood the threat in France and Spain and elsewhere of radicalization in prison. And so I think this is something they're going to have to look into. How yeah. does this happen? Is there actually a way to stop this? Often in prisons, the um, Islamic extremist convicts will be put together in one way, shape, or form. You know, maybe they have to rethink how yeah. this is done. But we're going to learn a lot about this in the days to come. Karen Greenberg, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next.